guys are really gruesome. I love it. But you really want me to talk about the death of Margaret Pole? Her execution was one of the most brutal to happen at the Tower of London. The 67-year-old Countess of Salisbury was accused of treason and Catholic plot, charges that she denied until the very end. The end came on the 27th of May in 1541. She was led out to the block at a private execution. I mean, there were 150 people there, so it wasn't that private. What they saw, they wouldn't forget. The main executioner was out of town, so the job was given to a young, inexperienced lad. His first blow of the axe hit her in the shoulder, and after that he hacked her head and shoulder to pieces. It took blow after blow, more than ten blows, to sever her head from her body. A later account thought that wasn't brutal enough, so had Margaret taunting the executioner, moving around, running away. I'd love to see her bones, I'd love to see them in a CT scanner, but I think we should probably leave her to rest in peace. The death of Margaret Clitheroe in 1586 was brutal. She was pressed to death. The pressing was a punishment designed to get a plea out of anyone who'd been charged with an offence but was keeping quiet. They would be held down and weights piled on top of them until they would give in and plea or die in the process. Margaret Clitheroe was charged with harbouring Catholic priests at her home in York at a time when they were outlawed in Protestant England. She chose to go to her death rather than face a trial in which her children would be implicated. So she was taken and stripped, she was held down. A stone the size of a wrist was put beneath her spine so that it would snap when her own front door was placed on top of her and stones piled on top of that. It took 15 minutes for her to die. It was still going on in 1731 when a chap called Joe Weeks was pressed under 400 pounds and he was suffering. Some bystanders decided to take mercy and help the process along by sitting on him. On a February day in 1587, Mary Queen of Scots, after a turbulent life, was led out to a dramatic end. Elizabeth I had been persuaded that Mary was a threat to the throne and had signed a death warrant, and now Mary faced the axe. Approaching the block, her black robes were removed to reveal undergarments of red Catholic defiance. Hands up if you think that's going to be an easy execution. The first blow of the axe kind of missed the spot, didn't complete the job, so a second blow was needed and still her head was attached by a wee bit to her shoulders. A third blow was needed. Her head rolled away, lips still twitching, as the executioner grabbed at it to hold it high. He only grabbed her wig. And then her skirt, her body started to move and out from underneath came her little dog who'd been in there hiding while she lost her life. Now Mary was interred at Peterborough and then on to Westminster Abbey, her possessions burnt to prevent souvenirs. And nobody ever mentions what happened to the dog. Colonel Daniel Axtell was one of the men executed, hanged, drawn and quartered for the killing of Charles I. Once the monarchy was restored in 1660, Charles II brought with him an appetite for retribution. He went after the men who killed his father. Axtell was a Puritan, a soldier, he fought in the Civil War, he did terrible things in Ireland, and he was captain of the Parliamentary Guard at the King's trial. In 1660, he was one of the 60 men who were sought for regicide. He was tricked into his arrest, he was put on trial and convicted, and he was hanged, drawn and quartered. This happened at Tyburn. The previous executions had happened at Charing Cross, but the locals complained about the stench of the burning bowels being too much, so it was moved out up to Tyburn, and that's where his took place. His head was put on a spike at Westminster, and his chopped up limbs thrown into baskets with everyone else executed that day. Piers Gaveston was the good-looking, clever, massively annoying and egotistical favourite friend of King Edward II. Having said that, he probably didn't deserve what they did to him. So he'd been in exile, come back, was made Earl of Cornwall, was accused of being the king's lover. He was really annoying to the other nobles. He liked to make up funny nicknames for them that they didn't like. Again, it's probably not a good reason to do what they did. But they'd fallen out with the king and the king was bestowing all sorts of stuff on his favourite friend. So in June 1312, he was kidnapped by the Earl of Warwick and taken to Warwick Castle Dungeon. I went on a school trip to Warwick Castle and all I remember is the torture dungeon. Anyway, they sentenced him to death and he was taken up to Blacklow Hill, which is on Lancaster's land, and it was given to two Welshmen to finish the job. So one ran him through with a sword and the other chopped off his head and they left him there to rot where they decapitated him. And it was left, uh, the job was left to some monks who did the good deed and buried the king's friend. Sir Thomas More was the former friend of King Henry VIII, who lost his head on Tower Hill in 1535. 
Now, he hadn't given his full support to the idea of an annulment of the marriage of Catherine of Aragon and the king, and he didn't support the idea of the king becoming the head of a church of England. When he was led to the scaffold to be beheaded, he noticed that it was weak. He made a comment and said he was worried someone might hurt themselves. And when he was up on there, putting his head down, he pulled his beard to one side. He said, well, that didn't commit any treason, that shouldn't get harmed. His head was chopped off in one blow and it was put on a spike on London Bridge. And normally after a couple of months, they'd take them off and throw them in the river to make room for others. But his daughter Margaret came along and bought it. And then she put it in a lead box and she kept it as a relic. Have you seen Oliver Plunkett's head? This is the Archbishop of Armagh, primate of all Ireland, who was falsely accused of treason in 1681 as part of the Popish plot, the alleged conspiracy to kill the king. And he was hanged and drawn and quartered at Tyburn, but remained incredibly calm throughout, considering he'd heard the Lord Chief Justice pronounce sentence. You shall be hanged by the neck, but cut down before you are dead. Your bowels shall be taken out and burned before your face. Your head shall be cut off and your body divided into four quarters. Now, those body parts were sent to Ireland and England and Germany and Rome. And some, a, an order of nuns got hold of his head and took it to Drogheda in Ireland and preserved it and kept it secret from the British for 200 years. Now, saint Oliver Plunkett is now the patron saint of um, peace and reconciliation in Ireland. And his 450-year-old preserved head can be seen at St Peter's Church in Drogheda. Three bodies could be seen hanging in chains from the gallows at Tyburn on the 30th of January in 1661. It was the 12th anniversary of the execution of Charles I and these bodies, well the men had long since been dead and buried, but they were exhumed from their resting places and on this chilling winter's day they were put up on display for all to see. The bodies belonged to John Bradshaw, Henry Ireton and the former Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell. At sunset they were taken down and they were beheaded, posthumously executed. The remains were thrown together and discarded into pits, but the heads were taken and put on 20 foot high pikes above Westminster Hall. That was where Charles I had been on trial. These men were regicides, killers of the king, and their heads remained up on these pikes for 30 years, looking down on everyone below. They were a grim reminder of well, what would happen if anyone would have issue with the new king, Charles II. So how are we feeling about the patron saint of pandemics? It's a king death story, of course. This is King Edmund, who was executed by the Vikings. Now, East Anglia had long had to deal with marauding Vikings. And in 869 AD or CE, uh, they came again. And, well, they overran King Edmund's defences in his army and he was taken prisoner. They asked him to renounce his faith and join them, but he refused. He was tortured, beaten, and still he refused. They grew impatient, they tied him to a tree, and they shot at him with a lot of arrows and spears. Then they cut off his head for good measure. His head was thrown away into the woods where it was protected by a mystery wolf until his men found the head and took it back again. He's also the patron saint of torture victims, which is understandable, but pandemics? Mm. You love a good execution story, TikTok. The more botched, the better. But the execution of Charles I? Well, his executioner was an experienced chap and he had a hack. As Charles I was led up to his execution, he noticed that the beheading block was really low. He asked for it to be raised and he was told no. Well, he wasn't in a position to make demands anymore. But there was a reason why it was set so low. If the execution block was set really high, the condemned would have to flex their neck and the axe would come through and was more likely to come through the lower part of the face. It was a bit messy. If the execution block was really low, then the condemned would have to extend their neck and the axe would likely come through a lot cleaner. He knew he was killing the king. He had to get this one right. The death of Hugh Despenser the Younger was a pretty gruesome one, so I'm going to I'm going to have to keep my head pretty still over here for this one. Hugh Despenser the Younger was another favourite of the deposed King Edward II and he was feared. Everybody loathed his confronting manner. He was detested. You get the point. Nobody liked him, especially Queen Isabella and Roger Mortimer, her lover. And when they captured him, well, he was accused of a lot of wrongdoings and he was sentenced to the death of a traitor. The same thing had happened to his father a month before, strung up, uh, head chopped off, his limbs thrown to the dogs. And now 
it was Hugh the Younger's turn. He was dragged through the streets naked. He was strung up on a ladder. His private parts were chopped off and thrown into the fire. Then he was disemboweled. His head was chopped off and he was cut up into quarters. His parts were sent all over the country and his head was put on a spike. On a September day in 1729, a crowd gathered at Edinburgh's grass market to witness the public execution of Maggie Dixon. And she was to be hanged for the murder of her infant child. And Maggie had concealed her pregnancy. The father wasn't her estranged husband. When the time came, she claimed that the baby was stillborn. And she took the, the baby's body down to the river to put it in to hide it, but she couldn't do it. So she left it on the riverbank. It was found and traced back to Maggie. There was an argument made that the baby must have been born alive and that she'd killed it. So she was sentenced to hang, and she did hang in public view. Her limp body was taken down and put in a coffin and into a cart. But then they heard a knocking. Maggie was alive. To hang from a rope and live was seen as God's forgiveness. So she was let free and lived another 40 years. There's a pub in Edinburgh called Maggie Dixon's. And when we're out of this lockdown, I'll see you there for a pint. Alice Lyle was said to have rejoiced at the killing of King Charles I and she paid for it with her own head. She was the last woman in England to be publicly beheaded. Her husband John had been one of the regicides who signed the death warrant of Charles I, so it's no surprise that the Stuarts were not fans of this family. Years later, when James II was on the throne, he had to deal with revolt and rebellion, and after the Battle of Sedgemoor, the rebels spread out across England. Alice Lyle was accused of harbouring two of the fugitives, a non-conformist minister and a lawyer. She said she had nothing to do with it. She didn't know she was looking after men in need. And she was the first to be tried during the bloody assizes, and she was sentenced to burning by hanging Judge Jeffreys. She petitioned the king, and he later changed it to beheading to fit her status. So at 71 years old, in 1685, she stepped out of this window in Winchester onto a scaffold and she had a go at her enemies, but she also forgave them as well, just in case. <laughs>